Hello. In this video, we're just going to discuss a little bit the overview of the theory of the difference in two population means. And here we are assuming the populations are independent. Now, essentially what I want to make the comment of is that the thought structure is very similar to everything we've learned before. Just some of the details. We're putting to combining some things and showing you some things that are a little different, but the basic thought process is the same. All right, so for the conditions, these should look familiar. We want to assume that the groups are independent. So for example, you wouldn't have any matched pairs like before and after, like test scores before and test scores after where you're talking about the same person. So they're in a sense, there's linking. Instead, they're independent groups. There's randomization in the way the uh, objects or people are selected. There's independence, where the outcome of one trait doesn't affect the outcome of another. The 10% rule, the sample size is less than 10% of the population. And representative sample, here we're talking about a numerical trait. So depending on the sample size, n equals what? Well, if n is small, which is considered to be less than 30, then you must show that the parent population is approximately normal. And you can use three tools for this. You could use a histogram box plot or normal prob probability plot. And if your sample size is greater than or equal to 30, then the central limit theorem applies. And then you'll already know that the distribution of sample, the difference in the sample means will be approximately normal. All right, so as long as conditions are met then, for confidence intervals, what we can see is that the structure, the basic thought process is the same. Regardless of whether I'm working with one proportion, a yes-no trait, one mean, a numerical trait, two proportions, the difference in two yes-no traits, or two means, the difference in two numerical traits, the thought process is the same. You take a sample estimate, and then you add or subtract a margin of error. It's just that the form of the sample estimate and the form of the margin of error vary a little bit. So for a one proportion, it's p hat. And then the margin of error is z times its standard standard error here, square root of p hat, 1 minus p hat over n. For one mean, the sample estimate is y bar, and then plus or minus for the margin of error, this. For the sample estimate for the difference in two proportions, it's you subtract p hat 1 minus p hat 2. Then you add or subtract margin of error. For two means, you subtract the two sample means, and then add or subtract margin of error. So you can see the similarities, and hopefully what you can also see is that when you have yes-no traits, you're using z. When you have numerical traits, you're using t. And so, but the thought process remains the same. So this is how, if you're doing this by hand, you would figure out the, two, the, difference, the confidence interval for the difference in two means. Okay? Now, if we were working with an hypothesis test, The hypo we'd start out with a hypothesis, right? And just as we did with the difference in two proportions, we assume that the trait is occurring in the same way in both populations. So in this case, the average of the trait for both populations is the same. And therefore, their difference is zero. And so essentially, you can when they're the same, that's the null. The alternative, you're countering and saying there's some kind of difference. Maybe one of the, the trait occurs less in one population than another, more in one population than another, or it's just different. And of course, using algebra, you can always subtract mu2 from both sides for this one, and you'd get the difference, mu1 minus mu2 is zero, versus whatever the counterclaim is. And here, of course, you could have written it in the other way, so you have, again, four possible formats to set up your hypotheses. But once you set up your hypotheses, then of course you assume you will work on your conditions, assuming your conditions are all right. Then you go ahead and say, look, let's take a look at the sampling distribution for the difference in the sample means. So again, the null is zero, right? Because again, you're assuming the two groups are the same, so their difference is zero. And now you create you find when you use find the standard error, you add it three times and subtract it three times to get the distribution of the difference in sample means, then you go to test it. When you actually go into the real world and take two samples, find the average for the two samples, and then subtract them,
you're going to get some number and you want to know where's this number where does it fall on this distribution so if it's close to zero then your null could be true it's very if it's very far from zero then you're probably going to reject your null right so the way you establish all this is you find the t-score for this difference in sample means. So you say this difference, how far is this difference from zero, the mean of the distribution? How far is this difference from zero standardized? That gives you your t-score. And then you find your p-value by going into your calculator, putting into tcdf from the lower t-score to the upper t-score, and then the degrees of freedom so that the calculator knows which t-distribution am I supposed to be working with. And out comes your p-value. Once you have your p-value, you proceed with your conclusion and you compare your p-value to the significance level and it's just like before use five percent if it's not given if it's given use whatever alpha they give you if the p-value is greater than alpha the probability of getting that sample difference that you saw is larger than the significance level you do not reject the null and you write in context there's not enough evidence that the alternative is true and when I mean in context you're obviously going to have to include the trait. What is it that you're tra measuring? The, you have to use the word average because it's a numerical trait. And you should include your populations. Right? And then if the p-value is less than the significance level, you reject the null. And you say, in context, there is strong evidence that the alternative is true. Right? So all of this applies. You could see that you really actually know most of this. The one snafu about all of this is that because we're talking about a numerical trait and therefore we have underlying t distributions we really need to know the degrees of freedom and here because we have two samples the sample sizes most often are not exactly the same size and so you have to have a formula to come up with the degrees of freedom and it's a hairy formula let me show you there it is. Very hairy formula. <laughs> now, let me show you where you would need to use this in your calculations. So when you're doing your confidence intervals, right here, when you would look up your t-multiplier, you would have to know your degrees of freedom, right? On your left-hand column of that t-table sheet, you'd look up your degrees of freedom and then cross it with the confidence level. So right there, you need to know it. And then for your hypothesis test, you would need to know your degrees of freedom right here to tell your calculator which distribution to use. Since this formula is so hairy, we will not be using, we will not be doing this by hand. We will be doing all our calculations and putting in all our information that the prob word problem gives us into the calculator. And then let the calculator give us the p-value and we'll make our conclusions. All right? But that is the general overview. Thank you so much for listening.